Well, hello everyone. I'm so thrilled that you've joined us today from wherever you're joining us from. Our church has a long history of loving and welcoming people from outside our four walls into our family. We have a deep love and concern for the community around us and the global family that we're part of. And so whether you're at one of our locations today in Harbor Creek or McCain, whether you're watching online or on social media or on TV, uh, I just want to thank you for being with us. And I hope you feel like family today. We're in a short two-week series called What Will Happen When You Die Before We Head Into Lent. And, and generally, we avoid thoughts about death, don't we? Which means we also don't think about heaven much either. Part of the reason is that, that even through, though 2020 was awful, most of us still live in relative comfort. Like, if you want to see when people thought about heaven a lot through history, it was people who were being persecuted on earth. African-American slaves invented a whole style of music called spirituals, whose themes were often built around a longing for heaven. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Like the early church had a phrase that, that we, we get exposed to in the book of Revelation, which simply says, come Lord Jesus. It was the Aramaic word Maranatha that, that all the 80s Sunday school kids will remember. But, but we're relatively comfortable, and so we don't long for heaven. And I think that's a mistake. So, so last weekend, Pastor John told us that death is the gateway to true life. And I'm just going to pick up on that same theme because I'm not convinced that we believe all the way down to our feelings that heaven is true life. Like, I'm not sure many of us are eagerly anticipating heaven. How the Bible talks about the end of your life and how you feel about it are often worlds apart. Because the Bible says things like, look forward to that day. Be of good cheer. Encourage one another with words about heaven. And yet when we think of the end, it's often not with a, a lot of good cheer. I heard a podcast by John Eldridge some years ago that made a, a very helpful point. So, so imagine me saying to you right now that I have received information over my hotline from God. You know, the one that all pastors have, and the red phone in my office. <laughs> so the hotline says, God, God told me to tell you that the world is ending next week. Some of you be like, I actually saw this one coming after 2020. So I have confirmation from God that you're going to die next week. What would you feel? Be honest. For, for many of us, I think it would be some combination of fear and loss, maybe a little scrambling, right? People with kids would, would mourn that they won't see their kids grow up. Or I mean, I remember when Kim and I were engaged, we'd been saving ourselves until marriage. And I remember praying, God, please let me just have sex one time before Jesus comes back, right? If this thing is going to end soon, we're conditioned to feel like we're losing something. And yet the Bible commands that, that when we think about the end, we should be filled with anticipation and longing. We think that to die is lost, but Paul says over in Philippians 1, 21, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Like if I die, it's gonna actually be better. And so where's the disconnect for us? And I think one of the main reasons for the disconnect is the fact that we haven't studied heaven enough. We haven't dwelled on it. We haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to comfort us with thoughts of it. We haven't pondered it enough to even long for it. And instead, we've accepted this vague notion of some faraway afterlife filled with harps and wings and marshmallow clouds. And I can't imagine wanting those things. Like, I'm not a fan of marshmallows or, or harp music. So, so why should I long for that? So, so we have a lot of misunderstandings. Randy Alcorn said it this way. He said, Satan need not convince us that heaven doesn't exist. He need only convince us that heaven is a place of boring, unearthly existence. And if we believe that lie, we'll be robbed of our joy and anticipation and we'll set our minds on this life and not the next. So true. And so today I want to try to bring some clarity to what heaven is like so that we can better dwell on it and long for it and anticipate our time there. And so to help us do that, I want to talk about the four myths about heaven. And we're actually going to bust some of these myths, kind of like the old myth busters used to do. And if I were going to summarize my thoughts into a big idea, it would be this. Heaven is going to blow your mind. All right. So to help us understand that, let's look at four common myths about heaven. Myth number one is that it will be boring. Let, let's just be honest here. Let's set aside all the nice Christian talk and shoot straight for a minute. For most of us, the picture that pops into our mind when we think of heaven for all eternity looks really, really boring. Like it's a lot of kneeling and bowing down and chanting. We maybe think of it like one big church service that goes on and on forever. And you're thinking, 
that might be fine for you, Derek. You seem to be into all that stuff. And Chrissy and Zach and Allison and Jordan, all those worshipy people, the singy, jumpy people, they might like it. But for me, like, you're saying, I, I, I get like halfway through just one service and I'm already thinking about the football game or what's for lunch or going shopping or whatever. Let me just tell you, if that's what you're thinking, you've believed a myth. Heaven will not be boring. And some of the descriptions that we have in the Bible about what heaven is like are things that, that we enjoy and appreciate on this world, only on steroids. And so let me put it this way. When was the last time you saw something in this world that took your breath away? For me, I remember being in the, in the Middle East with Kim back when we could travel, and we were in Jordan visiting the lost city of Petra. It was an ancient city that was forgotten for over 500 years and then rediscovered. It's a city of stone deep in the heart of rugged desert canyons and mountains. And so we hiked there through miles of these narrow cliffs that you could barely squeeze through. And then suddenly through the canyon, you could see this magnificent stone city open up. And, and we began to explore the caves and each one was more magnificent than the next. The stones were a rainbow of colors, pink and magenta and rose and orange swirls. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. It was totally breathtaking. What about for you? Maybe it was a sunset or a giant redwood or the vast ocean or the Grand Canyon. Maybe it was an incredible animal creation like a, a mandarin fish or a glass-winged butterfly. Look at that thing. Or, or a white tiger. Can we just agree for a moment that God doesn't do boring? And so how can heaven be boring if the most creative, brilliant mind in the universe, the one who created this amazing earth, the one who made every animal and every mountain, the one who makes rainbows and giraffes and platypuses, platypi, the, the one who made the fascinating universe that we learn more about, it seems, every week, and, and you think his crowning achievement, which is heaven, will be boring? Heaven is gonna be exhilarating. It's gonna be thrilling. Everything good in this life will be perfect in heaven. It will be better than you can ever imagine. Niagara Falls, the Great Barrier Reef, the Northern Lights, these are just a sneak preview of what awaits us in heaven. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. He says, God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That word show, he's gonna show us. In that verse is very important because it means a progressive, ongoing discovery as we learn more and more about his immeasurable riches while we're in heaven. Heaven is gonna be a place where there's an intellectual discovery going on again and again. It will be endlessly fascinating. And it's not just the scenery. Like that same creative God also dreamed up your dwelling place for eternity. So, so when Jesus talks about heaven in John 14, he says that he's leaving earth to go and prepare a place for his followers. And he refers to that place like mansions or spacious rooms. So, so there are gonna be dwellings and there's gonna be a city. Revelation 21, we get a glimpse of this new city. It's called the New Jerusalem. It says the, the, the walls around the city are pure jasper that the whole city glimmers with gold like clear glass. The streets are described as gold and like this transparent glass. The place is lit. Guys, I'm sorry, but it doesn't sound like we're gonna be mumbling boring prayers day and night in heaven. So, so whatever's the opposite of boring to you, that's what heaven is gonna be like. I'll repeat it. Heaven is gonna blow your mind. All right, let's look at myth number two. It's that we will become angels, float on clouds, and play harps all day, right? I just want to continue to bring clarity here about what we become and how we will fill our time. I want to deal with these myths in order, all right? The angels first, then the clouds, then the harps. The common myth here is to think that we turn into angels, but angels are a completely different kind of being. This is another reason that many people don't long for heaven. Like, life as a disembodied spirit is not something that I sit around anticipating. Guys, we don't become angels in heaven, certainly not looking like that. And I'm, I'm poking fun with the picture, but, but, but I do know that a lot of people get confused about this. They'll say things like, my grandma died or my cousin died and now they're an angel that watches out for me. And I wanna be very sensitive here because well-meaning people think this and it's a, a beautiful sentiment. And, and people who pass on do remain with us in some way, in our hearts, in our memories. But the Bible is clear that there's a distinction between people and angels, both now and in the future. 
and people will remain people and angels will remain angels. And right now, angels are more impressive beings than us. Psalm 8 says that we're a little lower than the angels, but it doesn't stay that way. In fact, becoming an angel in heaven would be a downgrade because in heaven, we're gonna be higher than the angels because we're gonna become, the Bible says, like Christ. So 1 Corinthians 6, 3 says that, that we're actually gonna be judging the angels. And so we don't become angels. Now, now, let me talk about the clouds. I think most people, when they think about heaven, they think about clouds. Like there's this bi bi biblical reference that, that talks about Jesus returning on the clouds. But I don't think this imagery mostly comes from, uh, I'm, from that, the Bible. I think the imagery that comes to our minds mostly comes from Renaissance era artwork that depicted heaven in the clouds. And so let me clarify. Eternity will be spent not on clouds, but in what the Bible calls the new heaven and the new earth. It's described not as fluffy marshmallows, but, but as having trees and houses and roads and vegetation. In fact, at the end of, the, of history, the Bible doesn't talk about us going somewhere else to heaven. It talks about Jesus returning and bringing heaven to earth. It's a description of restoration, as John described last week. So think about when you restore a car or a house you don't blow up the car or house first. You remove the bad parts and perfect what is salvageable. And Jesus is gonna restore earth to its eternal glory, which means we will have a continuation of some of the things that we love and are dear to us. Dallas Willard says it this way. He says, the life that you now live goes on. Now that's way different than disembodied cloud sitting. But most people don't really live like all things are gonna be restored that we will continue to live and experience them. Most people live like this world is it. Like get it all in now because it's all going away. This concept has been popularized by the phrase bucket list. Like you can find stuff all over the internet, 50 places to visit before you die, places to shop, places to golf, places to fly fish, stadiums to watch a game, put it on your bucket list. And it seems kind of harmless, but, but for Christians it actually represents bad theology. It represents a secular belief that your only shot is right now. This lifetime is as good as it gets. So, so if you're gonna enjoy it, you'd better enjoy it while you're still on this side of the dirt. Even people who believe in heaven, because of these myths, can be deceived into thinking, you know, well, heaven can be as good as Pebble Beach, or if I'm gonna to be sitting on a cloud, I better get to Bali while I'm healthy. I better enjoy all that stuff right now. But listen, <clears throat> the promise of Jesus, the promise of our faith is that you don't have a ticking clock that ends when you die. You have eternity to keep going. Didn't make it to the Grand Canyon, it's okay. Didn't make it to visit Australia, don't worry. You'll have all eternity to explore the best of God's handiwork that'll be even better. There's a fascinating passage in Matthew 19. Jesus is talking about heaven and, and Peter says, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Now, I want you to notice what Jesus doesn't do. He doesn't condemn the question. He doesn't say, Peter, you shouldn't be thinking about what you're sacrificing on this earth as gaining you in heaven. That's selfish and unspiritual. He doesn't say that. He also doesn't say, Peter, you're, you're, you're getting me. Isn't that enough? Like we like to get all holy and say, I don't want anything in heaven but Jesus. If, if I only have him, that's enough, which is totally true, but that's not what Jesus says here. And he doesn't say, hey, Peter, you should just be thankful that you're gonna gaze into my face for all eternity. That should be enough for you. He also doesn't switch the offer. He doesn't say, Peter, I know you gave up physical things, house and land and people, but you're gonna get a harp and a cloud and a spot in the heavenly choir. That's not what he says. Look what he does say, verse 28. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. And so Jesus acknowledges here that the disciples gave up some things to follow him. Notice what he mentioned, houses, family members, lands. And he says, you're gonna receive all of those things a hundredfold and you're gonna get eternal life on top of it all. So, so, so to the mom who says, I don't wanna die, Jesus, not yet, I wanna see my kids grow up. Or to the young couple who says, he gets married and says, I don't, don't come back until we get to, to get married. Jesus says, I'm giving it all back and more. Houses, lands, relationships. Not endless cloud sitting, that sounds horrible. 
So, but a word about harps, and, and then let's throw in singing for good measure. Yes, we will worship God for all eternity. But when we hear that, and our minds immediately go only to singing, it just shows how undeveloped our 2021 American theology of worship is. As I've said many times before, worship is not just singing. Worship is much bigger. When God created Adam and Eve in the garden, they, they worshiped him. But what did that look like? Like they weren't raising their hands all day and singing songs. No, they worshiped him by tending their place, by taking care of the garden, by naming the animals, by having dominion and authority over the earth. We worship God by living lives that point to him and doing what he's asked us to do. And so yes, you will worship God in heaven and you'll do it by working productively and making important decisions for the glory of God. And I'm sure we will sing because we're a singing people, but we will do so many other things. So, so heaven's gonna be a place of productivity and accomplishment. Revelation 22 says this, it says that in the new earth, his servants will worship him and they will reign with him. So, so in heaven, we will work, we will reign, but it will be work that is restful, work without the curse, totally fulfilling and purposeful. So no, we will not be bored, we will not be angels, we will not be endlessly singing and swinging on heavenly hammocks and drinking pina coladas, though I'm sure there will be some of that. Here's myth number three. We will lose our identities. Some people believe that we will turn into nameless, faceless spirits that just get absorbed into God. That is not Christianity. That is Eastern religion. This comes from a worldview that says that what's wrong with the world is everything physical. Our physical bodies are, are where the evil lies, where our passions reside. And true enlightenment, they say, will come when we finally throw off these physical shackles and merge our consciousness with the great spirit in the sky. Again, this is not Christianity. So one of the byproducts of the resurrection, which is the core doctrine of the Christian faith, one of the byproducts that, that, that in addition to being saved by Jesus' vi victory over death, we too will have our resurrected bodies after death. And we will retain our identities and be forever restored. And so as John mentioned last week, that there'll be this period when we die that we exist as spirits in the presence of Christ awaiting our resurrected bodies. But the day will come before we know it that we will be both physical and spiritual beings again. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 says it this way. This perishable, perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And on that day, when we receive our resurrected bodies, we will be most fully ourselves. Earlier in the, this chapter, Paul defines our resurrected bodies as filled with glory and power and spiritual fervor. We'll, we'll eat and drink and we'll talk and sing and work and love and laugh. And just as you will be most fully yourself, so will everyone else. And so Revelation 7 paints this picture of every tribe and language and people and tongue gathered all together. We will all recognize individuals and the great kaleidoscope of God's creative genius. And, and yet we will all be one and we will be fully ourselves. And although there's a great mystery surrounding all this, it seems that we will retain our identities, which means that we'll, be, we'll recognize each other after we die. In Matthew 17, we find the story of the transfiguration. Peter and James and John were with Jesus on the mountain when they received a visitation from two saints who were already dead. And, and Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. And if you wish, I'll, I'll make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. One of the interesting things about this is that Peter recognized Moses and Elijah. There's this indication that we retain something of our identities after we die. Our resurrected bodies will certainly be different in some way to, to what we have now. But, but the disciples, for example, they, they struggled to recognize Jesus in his new body, but they eventually did. And so we're gonna retain our identities in some form, which means we'll recognize people in heaven and we'll be reunited with friends and family members. You know, I think that being with Christ will be the absolute greatest joy of heaven, but the next greatest joy will be our reuniting with loved ones who have gone before us. That hope is what makes Christian funerals bearable. Heaven's gonna be a place of unbelievable reunions for families and friends, loved ones and spouses, and we will recognize each other, husbands and wives. Like the guy who, whose wife died before him by a decade. And when they were finally reunited in heaven, she was showing him around the place and she said, isn't it wonderful? And he said, yeah, and I, I, it could have been here a lot sooner if, if you hadn't fed me all that kale, <laughs> which, 
Which brings up an interesting question about marriage in heaven. Many people have lost a spouse and they can't wait to reunite with them in heaven. Others may have experienced a divorce or a few divorces and may wonder which spouse they would be married to in heaven. Or even others have remarried along the way and, and, and would that mean that they would be married to multiple spouses? How does that all work? Well, the Sadducees asked Jesus about this in a little bit of a different way uh, that will still help us to answer the question. They were asking about a woman who may have been married to a number of different men. Whose wife would she be in the resurrection? And Jesus answered this way in Luke chapter 20. He said, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, there's much more to be said about this passage, but I, I need to leave it here. There will not be marriage as we know it in heaven. Like if you had a great marriage, this passage makes you sad. If you have a crappy marriage, you're like, whew, right? But spouses will know each other. They will love each other in heaven with the incredible love of Christ. But we must remember that marriage on this earth was made for covenant and procreation and ultimately as a symbol to point us to the true love of Christ and his church, which we will experience in all its fullness together, but in a different kind of way than we did on earth. Our identities will be intact. We will know and recognize loved ones in heaven. And something I'm looking forward to is meeting some of the great saints of history and, and, and the Bible and asking them many, many questions. Okay, it won't be boring, we won't be angels, we won't lose our identities, here's the fourth myth. All people and dogs go to heaven. Uh, so let me start, I get the question all the time, will my pets be in heaven? And the answer is simple, dogs yes, cats no. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah, listen, the Bible talks about animals in heaven. Animals will be in heaven. They were part of the original creation, they'll be part of the, the new creation. But it's also true that pets, while they have consciousness, don't necessarily have souls. So what does that mean for our pets? I'm not sure, honestly. But I think God will figure it out and it's not worth losing sleep over. The more serious part of this myth is the one that, that, that really is one of the most common myths in our time. And it's this idea that everyone is going to heaven. But Jesus was clear. Everyone dies, everyone has eternity, but not everyone spends their eternity with Jesus. Some will go to heaven, some will go to hell. Jesus said this in Matthew 25, 31. He said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. These are Jesus' own words describing what's gonna happen at the end. That There's not a lot of interpretive wiggle room here. All of humanity will either receive eternal punishment or eternal life. You and I will be on Jesus' right or on his left on that day. And it begs the question, how can we pin our hopes on heaven? And here's the answer. The only way to re receive eternal life is to make an appropriate decision about Jesus Christ during this lifetime. You cannot earn your way there by good works. We, we must put all faith, all trust and confidence in the work of Jesus on the cross. Like if you ask most people, how do you know you're going to heaven? They're gonna say something like, well, I'm trying to be a good person. Guys, your best effort will never ever be good enough. God's standard is perfection and none of us can achieve that. We've all fallen short. And when the end comes for me, and my life is on display and all my sin, and I've committed tons of them, when all my sin is on display and I have to give an account of why I should enter heaven, I'm gonna point to Jesus. Like my only hope on that day is Jesus, that I've placed my whole life, my will, my desires, my family, my career, my hopes and dreams, my decisions under the Lordship of Jesus and how he made a way for me on his cross. My hope is Jesus that day. And my hope is that he will look at the sum total of all my sins and that he will look to his father and say, yes, Derek did every one of those things that are appalling to you, all of those evil deeds. And yes, he deserves death. But wait, but wait, I've paid for every single sin. I've paid for every one of those. And I've written his name in the book of life. Let him enter your glory. Guys, that's the 
only hope we have. Not everyone goes to heaven automatically. You have to surrender your life to Jesus. Now, what do we do with all this? What are some next steps from this message? Well, whenever Jesus talked about the end, he had some common themes. He would say things like, be ready and be watchful. Readiness is just living a holy life. It's making sure that you've made peace with God, that you've surrendered heart, soul, mind, and strength to his lordship. And if you haven't done that yet, guys, today is the day. Don't go to sleep tonight without surrendering your life to Jesus. And then being watchful has to do with anticipation. I really think part of increasing our anticipation of heaven is just doing what we just did. Spend some time pondering it, investigating it, thinking about it, studying it. Let your heart swell with the anticipation of heaven. Be ready and watchful. But the second thing I wanna say is, take as many people with you as possible. Like if you know that this kind of eternity is available and you know what the alternative is, you need to tell the people you love. Encourage them to investigate the life and teachings of Jesus. Invite them to church. Like if you know the way and you don't tell them the way, you're not truly loving them. And listen, they're not gonna wanna miss it and neither are you. Because as we establish today, heaven is gonna blow your mind. Now I wanna close by painting a picture for you. It's a little account that I often share at, at funerals to help give hope to those who are grieving. It's gonna help us to set our hearts and minds on the glories of heaven. I think it originated with a guy named Gene Apple and it goes something like this. Sometimes the writers of the Bible would run out of words to describe what will be in heaven. They would move to words about what won't be in heaven. And so the Apostle John was given a glimpse of heaven when he wrote, God himself will be with them as their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Now, if you look at the, the key things that won't be there, he says there won't be mourning, no crying, no pain. Heaven will be entirely different than this world in this way. It is a place of pure joy and delight. So many have experienced such heartache and stress and depression and disease in this past year. There will be none of it in heaven. Some of you live with physical pain in your body every day. Heaven will be pain-free, Advil-free, arthritis-free, COVID-free, no dentures, no counting fat grams, no Rogaine. <laughs> People who are in wheelchairs are gonna be able to run and walk and skip. Some of you have kids with special needs. They will be healthy and whole. They will have able bodies and able minds. Some of you live with emotional scars and nightmares and memories and flashbacks and heartbreaks and disappointments from your past that are simply overwhelming to you. You will have none of that. They will be gone. There will be no anxious waiting rooms. There will be no empty tissue boxes. No tear-stained divorce papers. No motionless ultrasounds. No tiny caskets. No bloated, starving stomachs on TV. And did you notice who that passage just said is going to wipe away every one of your tears when you get to heaven? It says God himself will wipe the tears from their eyes. God himself which means the same hands that carved the mountains, that the same hands that healed blind eyes and made sick people well, the same hands that were nail pierced for our salvation will wipe the tears from your cheeks. It's an amazing picture of the tenderness of God. So heaven won't just be amazing for the scenery and adventure. It'll be amazing for the personal healing and restoration. And listen, the day is coming. One of these days is gonna be your very last day on this planet. You don't get to predict it. You don't get to control it. And there's one of the little boxes on that calendar of your life that's gonna be the very last box. You cannot escape death. And even though it's hard for us right now to see what life is like on the other side of the glass in that unseen world, there is something so much more extraordinary, so much better. And you don't have to fear it if you've been redeemed by Jesus Christ. You know why? Heaven is beyond your wildest imagination. It's indescribable. Heaven will blow your mind. Let us long for that day. Let us say with all the 80s Sunday school kids, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. I love you guys. See you next week.